Good morning. So good to see everybody. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Today is going to be a little bit different from normal services that we have, if you can't tell uh, so far, only doing one song to start out. Um, today is going to be a day where we actually take a look at some future vision for our church. Paul's going to come here in just a minute to talk about some things that the elders have been thinking about lately and uh, talk about what uh, some ideas are for some potential uh, new vision for our church. So um, as he comes to do that in a minute, let me, let me pray for us. Father, we're thankful that we can be here this morning, 
and that we can come worship. And just like that song said so perfectly, you beat the grave. You, you went to the cross for us, and gosh, we're just so thankful for that, that you would be willing to sacrifice yourself in that way. So um, we come here this morning just humbled by the love that you offer us so freely. We're humbled by the fact that you uh, would die such a hard death, and you did that because you love us so much. So thank you that you would do that for us. We pray here that this morning as we listen and as we worship that our hearts would be softened towards you, that we would walk away from today uh, feeling strengthened in your name. We're grateful that we can come and worship such a mighty God, and it's in your name we pray this this morning. Amen. Morning. Thank you for being here today. As, uh, as Todd shared, uh, this morning will be a little bit of a different service, but I hope not too different. And um, we'll have an opportunity uh, together to celebrate communion uh, as a, a church family later on. I'd like to invite you to open up a Bible if you have one, or uh, a Bible app if you have one of those, uh, or take a look uh, behind me on the screen. We're going to think uh, this morning uh, about Matthew uh, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And uh, so why don't you read along as I read these words this morning. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's uh, pray together one more time. Father, we thank you for these wonderful words of Jesus Christ, and we pray that they would ring in our ears today as we seek to hear from you and as we seek to gather together as a community of people who um, want to be called your children. Thank you for this morning. We pray that you would give us sharp minds, and uh, we pray that you would even prepare our hearts as we get ready to celebrate communion today. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this uh, passage that we have here is one of the most important passages in the New Testament. Uh, we call it the Great Commission, and what we have in it is Jesus' final command. This was his last instructions, not, not just to the apostles who were there at that moment, but to every generation of Christians who would come after them, including us today. So this is not just the Great Commission, this is our Great Commission. This is what Jesus Christ says that our church is to be all about, going and making uh, disciples. And in fact, uh, many years ago when the elders developed our purpose statement, we based it around this passage. We say that Grace Church exists. Our, our reason for being is to make disciples, first of all, who are alive in Christ. Uh, that speaks to our, our relationship with God. To make disciples who are connected with each other, and, and that speaks to our relationships with other believers in Christ around us in the church and that we also are to make disciples who are engaged in the world. And, and that's our relationship with those who don't yet have a relationship with Christ. So that everything that we're seeking to do and, and to be as a church is encapsulated in those words. We want to make disciples by building uh, relationships. And so this morning, what we're going to do in just a few minutes is, is I want to share a, an idea with you this morning that uh, the elders and, and several others in our leadership have been prayerfully thinking about for around um, 18 months. And, and it's not an idea that we've made any decisions on. I, I really want to underline that. 
but it's something that we want to invite everyone in our church to be praying about and to be thinking about and to be talking about and to give us some feedback uh, on. Um, we, we really want everyone's voice to be heard in this conversation. It's very important to us. But before I get into the specifics, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about relationships, both within our church here as a community and also our relationships with those who are outside of Grace Community but exist within our, our wider community. One of the things that, that I think has impacted so many people through the ministry of Grace Church is our history of being really quite centered around building rich relationships among the people who are a part of our church. Um, relationships are, are a part of our DNA. In fact, one of our core values, if you look on our website, is that God changes lives best when truth is experienced in the context of spiritual loving relationships. That's a little bit of a mouthful, but basically what it means is that God changes our lives best through friendship with one another. Um, one of the necessary components to living the Christian life is developing deep friendships with other people who can help you to do that, and, and you can help them to do that. And we want to be a church together where rich and, and meaningful relationships among the members are normal. But that being anonymous and, and kind of hanging on the fringes is, is strange. Now, now the problem is that building those kinds of rich relationships is difficult. And it's something that has, is growing increasingly difficult in, in our culture. Uh, today, studies show that half of Americans report having three, fewer than three close friends, okay, three or less, and 12% of Americans report that they have no friends at all. Imagine that, 12% of people with no friends. Now, certainly there's lots of reasons for this, but, but one of them is that Americans spend so much of their lives sitting in front of what? Screens. Right? The average American spends 10 hours sitting in front of a screen. And as a result, we live lives that are much more lonely and isolated than people of previous generations would have ever imagined. And I think that this is one of many reasons why things like anxiety and depression are, are rising. People don't have the kind of supportive relationships that they, that they need anymore. Now, strong relationships, friendships, are vital to physical, emotional, and spiritual health, but they're becoming much more difficult to develop today. And what this means for us, the part that I want to underline, is that the Great Commission, our Great Commission as a church, discipling people through relationships is getting harder, and it will only increase to move in that direction. I always feel for people who are newer to our church. You know, I know that that's, that's some of you in, in this room right now. It can be so challenging to get to know people and to start building friendships and to figure out where to plug in. And that's even more true today, I, I believe, than it ever have, has been in the past. So one of the things that we've been doing as leadership is to spend some time thinking about how we prioritize developing friendships at Grace Church. I want everyone in this room to have great friends here at, at, at Grace Church, but, but how do we help that to happen? Um, how, how do we, uh, as a leadership, cr create the kind of environment where that is, is more likely? That's one thing that we've been spending some time thinking about. But something else has been on our hearts as well, and that is, a desire to also reach out into our community to build deeper relationships with, with those who have little or no church background or spiritual background. Um, that's something that we've been thinking a lot about too. Today, I would say in general that Grace Church tends to draw people who already have a church background. Right? Either they're coming, they've moved into the area, and um, 
they, they've attended another church, and now they've come to our church, or maybe they've drifted away from church for a while, and, and they're coming back. And I'm really happy that we draw people like that. Um, I, I think that that's wonderful. But we also have a very big heart for people that do not have a church background. The, the problem is that, that not only studies, but also our own experience shows that unchurched people, people that don't have a church background, are increasingly less likely to attend a church. So, so 20 years ago, if an apartment complex was built next to our church, we would just assume that some of those people would trickle into grace. You know, they'd, they'd see there's a church in their backyard, and, and they'd come over and want to see what we're doing. But, but that is less and, and less uh, the case today. And in fact, we haven't seen much of that. So again, not just with building relationships within the church, but building relationships with those that are outside of the church, the Great Commission is getting harder. And, and it's not in terms of reaching people outside of the church that we aren't doing our best to reach them. It's not that we don't love people and don't care about them. The point is really just that, that, that today, more creativity and intentionality is needed than ever before. So what, what we really desire to do is to intensify our focus on reaching people who do not yet know Christ. The Lord loves them, and we love them, and we want them to be able to experience and, and enjoy what the Lord has given to us in Christ. Now, when I say that we're, we're, we're really thinking about how to reach into uh, our community, I, I just want to say we are not aiming to be a seeker church or a mega church, if, if those words mean anything to you. If they don't, don't worry about it. But if they do, that's not what we're trying to be. We intend to always be, I suppose, as, as the Lord allows us to be so, a medium-sized gospel-centered, Bible-teaching church with a mission of planting other churches. Okay, We don't want to just plant another church. We've already planted two. We don't just want to plant another one. We want to keep planting churches into uh, the future, which means starting churches in other communities. However, the community that we are in, in White Lake, is a big community. There's 31,000 people that live in White Lake alone, and we feel that there's an opportunity for us as a congregation to reach more of them. So, so we want to be a church that's really good at reaching people with church backgrounds, people that are coming back to church after some time away, and people who have never been to church before, who have no idea what Christianity really is, is all about. And what that has done for us is it's led us to consider how we can build a stepping stone or a bridge into our community. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me talk a little bit about our, our church building. We have a wonderful church building. We have a church building that has changed a lot since we first purchased it. It had dirt floor down in the basement. Remember that, Tom? I remember running around in here as a little kid before it, it was, there was even carpet in this room, I, I don't think, at the time. Our church building has grown. We've added to it. It's nicer and far more comfortable than it ever has been. We've got wonderful people who take care of it. But one of the, the weaknesses of our present building is that it is geared more towards stationary groups than it is for activity. It's a wonderful building for sitting, like we're doing now, but we don't have a lot of room for activity. Now, the thing that is an issue about that is that people tend to build friendships initially, how? usually through activity, right? They, they, they usually build friendships by doing things together, participating in stuff, having fun, sharing and partnering together in common interests, laughing and playing. And then it tends to be through those initial experiences 
that a basis for deeper connection is formed, right? We, you don't want to just stick with that level of friendship, but, but those kinds of things tend to be an icebreaker through which um, deeper and richer friendships begin to develop. And so the opportunity that the elders want to propose to the church today and, and to have us consider, in fact, we're, this is, you can almost call this a study that we're doing, we want to see what everybody thinks, is to, to build a new space on our property that we're calling a community life center. And, and the, the purpose in that is to give us, as a church community, more room for activities. Now, um, the community life center would, would include basically three things. Uh, a multi-purpose gym space. Uh, second of all, a larger kitchen. And then finally, some flexible uh, meeting rooms. And, and we, we feel that this could be a part of a plan for us to be intentional about building relationships, building friendships, both within the community of Grace Church, but also as a bridge out into the community around us so that we have a place to enjoy and build upon shared common interests. So a little bit about how we could envision uh, utilizing a space like, like this. Well, it, it would provide us the opportunity to um, participate in, in a number of different activities that we can't do now, or at least not very well in some cases. The most obvious would be sports. We, we would have a place where we could play basketball or volleyball or, or pickleball, things of, of that nature. But it wouldn't be just the athletics itself. It, it would be we could offer people teams, communities of people that are working together in, in sports, or just a place that people could come and hang out and be active together, especially on, on days like this one, winter days. Actually, this one's not so bad, is it? We'd be able to offer things like exercise classes and self-defense classes like we did a couple of weeks ago, student ministries and children's ministries and ministries like homework help and buddy break would have all kinds of new creative opportunities for ministry. Um, people could use that space to have a, a holiday party or a reception uh, of some kind, a, a larger size gathering. Um, the church would have a dedicated place where we could have events together where we could all be in the same room. You know, after church today, we're going to have a lunch, and, and it's difficult for us to, to have space. And, and we certainly can't be in the same space together. We would be able to offer year-round uh, activities and, and family events. And we'd have meeting space that wasn't used by other groups. So we, we, could, we could offer things like art classes or sewing groups or um, places for people to work on projects or even co-work together, potentially. Now, now those are just a few ideas. But the, the main thing is that we would envision the Community Life Center to be kind of like a blank canvas. You know, you think of just blank canvas that Anyone in the church, no matter what they were interested in doing, could gather a few people together and utilize that space for that thing. So whatever ministry we could envision, whatever community building activities, that space would be kind of flexible enough so that we could um, utilize that space together. But this is the key. We would also be inviting those who are outside of our church to participate, too. We would use it as a, br a bridge, a, a stepping stone. I, I have invited a lot of people to our church over the years. It's easy for me to do that. When they find out I'm a pastor, I usually invite them. And I'm sure that, that many of you have, too. Probably 95% of the people that I invite to church, I don't ever see them at church. They all tell me yes, though, you know, because... I think they feel bad saying, saying no. But, but even right now, if, if um, we invite a person to church, a lot of times what I'm, what I'm saying is our services are at 9.30 and 11.15, right? Or I have a small group that I lead. I'd love for you to come and, and join us. That would be great to have you there. The thing is, if a person doesn't have a church background, 
they're probably not going to be drawn to that initially, right? And I hope if they came, they would really experience something wonderful and, and good. But it's not like oh, they think, oh, I would love to be a part of a service, been really wanting to do that, or to sit in, in a small group. But imagine if we were to say to a person, yeah, I, I go to Grace Church, and by the way, we're, we're, there's a group of us who play basketball on Thursday mornings. Would you have any interest in, in, in coming to do that? Or hey, there's an art class that we offer on Tuesday nights. Or we've got some activities that your kids might be interested in. Or we're having a dinner together or some sort of family game night. I hope you get the idea. The, the point is to provide a space where we can build friendships, give people the opportunity for us to get to know them and this, them to get to know us for the purpose of living out and sharing God's love for them in Jesus Christ. So stepping stone is the big idea. Now, one more thing um, uh, uh, about that is uh, I had always thought that the first main project that I would ever bring to the church like this would um, be a church plant, starting a, a, a new church. And I realized that this is a little bit uh, different. Um, to be honest, our experience with COVID was something that um, created a lot of thought in, in me and, and, and um, you know, it sparked a lot of conversation among the leadership. So a community life center wasn't something that was on my mind three or four years ago, even though it is an idea we've been kind of kicking around for 20 years unseriously, okay? We've, we've gotten more serious about it recently. But I do feel that this would be a project that would also tie into our church planting efforts. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I'll, I'm just going to mention one this morning. One of the biggest challenges to starting a new church is finding a location for that church to, to start in. It's very hard to find space. And when we planted um, Grace Commerce about 15 years ago, um, we couldn't find a space for a good couple of years, I, I believe it was. And so initially, they had to meet downstairs in our high school room. Well, for different reasons, that was a very unideal spot for them to leave. Part of it was it, it required them to meet at a certain time. They had to meet early because the teenagers were going to be coming in to use that space. And as soon as their service was over, rather than getting to hang around and, and, and be with each other and build relationships, they had to leave and because um, the teenagers had to um, spend time in, in the room. And they were also still a, a part of this space here, which was difficult because they were also going out from here. So there, there were a lot of things about that space that, that was unideal. Um, one of the things that we envision as a possibility is that this space could give a new church plant um, an opportunity to have someplace that was separate and something that they could use in a way that worked best for them. And again, if we were to build a space like this, it wouldn't just be for the next church plant. It would be for all of the church plants that the Lord allows us to do in the future. This would be a place that we would be building for the next, what, 70 years. I don't know how long do buildings last these days. A long time. Now, one last thought, and then we're going to continue um, with our service. There is one word that Jesus says in the Great Commission that is very, very important. And it happens to be the shortest word. And that is the word go. Jesus says that as we fulfill the Great Commission, part of that involves that we go. And, and what that means is that Jesus expects us to be moving forward and moving towards other people with the message of the gospel. Now, I think it is very natural today, and, and, I, and I feel this within myself at times, it's natural and, and easy for individual Christians and churches to adopt especially in times like we are in today, a kind of a bunker mentality. When, when times are changing and the culture around us starts to feel a little bit less friendly and predictable, 
And when the future seems like it's more uncertain than the past, we, we can't count on the things that, that we could before, sometimes what we can do is we can talk ourselves into thinking that the best thing to do is to hunker down and batten up the hatches. You know, we, we should play it safe. We should seek to maintain what we have and not risk losing anything. And that's why Jesus' one word here needs to resonate with us. Jesus says, no, don't do that. He says, go. And, and, and why can we go? Well, he says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? So things may look uncertain to us, but things are not uncertain to God. God is in charge of all of it, and he has a plan that he is certainly working out. So what Jesus is saying is he's saying, have courage. No, no matter what's happening around us, no matter how things get, no matter how bad they are, it is always an exciting time to be the people who have the opportunity to carry the good news of Jesus Christ into a hurting world that needs a savior. Now I want to underline this. None of what I just said means that we need to build a community life center. Okay, I, I don't mean that. I, I don't want to manipulate anyone. It's just one idea of, of how we could do that. It's an idea that we're studying. Like I said, it's an idea we really want to get your feedback on, no matter how you feel about it. And in fact, maybe somebody will have a better idea as we go through the process. So it doesn't mean that we have to do what I'm proposing this morning, but what it does mean is that as a church, we've got to be looking both outward and also into the future as we think about how we as a congregation can intentionally move forward in our great commission. So we want you to be thinking about that we want you to be praying about that. I, I want to impress these things on your hearts and minds. What do you think it looks like for Grace Church to continue to go? Now, wherever we go, I can't wait to find out. Whatever we choose to do, I don't know, but God knows. I'm very glad that we get to do it together. I am very thankful for this community, e each one of you. I know I don't know all of you as well as I know some of you, but I'm very thankful for each of you. And I'm also very excited for whatever it is that our future holds. So, wherever we go, whatever we do, may God grant us a measure of his courage and may he also grant us from his wisdom. And may we move towards this process as a unified community, pleasing to the Lord, and above all else, seeking to bring him glory. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you we praise you. We love you. Thank you for giving us the gift of Jesus Christ. Thank you that he brings into our hearts grace, salvation, love in ways that, frankly, we can't even fathom. I pray that you would help us to be a church that um, makes disciples Pray that you would help us to be a church that wants to be disciples. And we pray that whatever it means for us to go, that you would send us, that you would teach us, that you would give us your wisdom and your heart. We pray as we transition into music and into communion that uh, our spirits would be drawn uh, to you through your spirit. And we thank you for your goodness and your power and your glory. And we give all glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's stand and sing together. that we go and the reason that we seek to make disciples is because we have such a wonderful message that we carry with us and and that message is so well summarized uh, through the act of communion together participation at the Lord's table and as we uh, spend uh, some time together 
um, I thought one way to, um, to just move through this process this morning is I, I'd like to put something on the screen uh, behind us. This is from the Heidelberg Catechism, and it's, it's question 81. It's a wonderful question, and I think such a helpful answer, and that is, who should come to the Lord's table? Who should come to the Lord's table? Who should participate in what we're doing uh, this morning? And um, first of all, the Catechism answers that question in this way. It says, first of all, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sin. And this is a very helpful statement because it tells us that this table is, first of all, for honest Christians. Um, communion is not uh, a reward that we get at the end of the month for good behavior. Communion is not a place that we come to to kind of give ourselves a pat on the back for living good Christian lives. The Bible teaches that communion is a time of confession and it's a time of self-reflection. It's a time where we acknowledge that we're not okay, that we have failed, that we have sinned, that we have fallen short. It's a time for people who are displeased with themselves because of their sin. So if you look back over the last week or day or month or whatever it is and you say, you know, I'm not real proud of myself in some ways, then communion may be for you, it's for honest Christians. The Catechism goes on, it says, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ. So communion is not just for honest Christians, it's also for faithful Christians. Now, when I say faithful Christians, I don't mean that means that they've done everything right, but I mean it's for people that are putting their faith in someone, They're, and it's not themselves. It's a person who is putting their faith in Jesus Christ alone, trusting that through his work on the cross, which is illustrated in, in, in what we do when, when we eat the bread, we remember that Jesus' body was crushed as a payment for our sins in our place. When we drink the juice, we remember that his blood was shed so that ours doesn't have to, so that we could be forgiven. And we trust that our sins are pardoned and our remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Jesus Christ. So communion is for honest Christians. It's also for Christians that are full of faith faith specifically in Jesus Christ and his finished work through his death and resurrection. And then it goes on, it says, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering death of Jesus Christ and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. So it's also for repentant Christians who are full of hope. I'm going to add that last part at the end. It's for Christians that want to leave this experience differently. They want their faith strengthened. They want to live a life that's more pleasing to the Lord. They desire to change, and they have hope that that's not just up to themselves on their own, but, but it is the Lord and his spirit that empowers that change. So communion is for honest Christians, faithful Christians, repentant Christians, and then finally, serious Christians, serious Christians. It says hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Now, what does that mean? That means that communion is not meant to be for us a neutral experience. That any time that we celebrate communion, we always receive something positive, right? Which is the Lord's forgiveness and grace and mercy and strength and empowering. Or we receive something negative, which is judgment. 
And the catechism uh, very rightly reminds us that this is not just meant to be a routine. It's not just meant to be something that we do just to do. We're not allowed to pretend. We must take it seriously. So communion is for honest Christians. It's honest before the Lord. An open book with no pages hidden. It's for faithful Christians. Not Christians who have acted faithfully, but Christians who are putting their faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. It's for repentant Christians, for Christians that want to change, for Christians that want to grow, that want to honor the Lord. And it's for serious Christians. It's for Christians who are not just going through the motions. And, and it is a gift and a blessing for all of us. Now, with those words in mind, I, I want to uh, read for us the words of the Apostle Paul, who said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In just a moment, uh, those who desire to do so are invited to come and uh, take the bread. Why don't we pray uh, for the bread, and then we'll break it. Father, this morning, we thank you that we can come before you not as proud people, but as people who are honest and displeased with ourselves because of our sins. We thank you that um, we don't have to hide from you. We, we don't have to put on masks and pretend. But we also want to come to you as people who trust that our sins are pardoned and that our weaknesses are covered, not by our own good deeds and better behavior, but through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, our Savior, which this event points to today. And Father, we also desire more and more that you would strengthen our faith even this morning and that you would help us to live a life of love for you and other people in greater and deeper ways. As we participate today, Father, we pray that you would protect us from hypocrisy. We pray that you would give us repentant hearts. And we pray that our desire would be to lay our lives down at your feet and to give all of who we are for you. We, we belong to you. And we thank you for the work of Jesus Christ, who has purchased us in his death and, and resurrection. We pray these things in his name. Amen. In the front, we have gluten-free bread for anyone who needs that. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Give thanks for the cup. Father, we also thank you for this juice this morning and even though it doesn't become a magical substance, it is meant to remind us of your blood that was shed for us. Father, we thank you and praise you that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ. What a wonderful truth to rest in and enjoy. And we pray that out of that, you would help each of us to go and to be disciples, and to seek to make disciples of all nations. We thank you for your promise that you are with us always, even 
to the end of age. We are so safe in your hands. We are so loved and secure. Thank you for that this morning. And as we drink of the juice, we pray that we would trust that and enjoy that anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if those words that I uh, described earlier apply to you, if you are honest before the Lord, trusting in faith in Jesus Christ, desiring to live a repentant life, and serious about the things that we do this morning, we invite you to come and just to enjoy this, just to soak in the grace of and mercy of Jesus Christ, his love for you, his love for his people. As you feel prepared to do that, please do. If you are not in that place, and I've, I've not been in that place at times, feel free to stay in, in your seat. We'll be doing it again next month. Get your heart ready for, for that time and, and, and that period. And um, I'd, I'd be proud of that. I'd be proud to stay if I didn't feel ready to go. But I want to open up the table and invite you to come if and when you feel prepared.
move into the part of our service where we think about our giving. Uh, there are a number of ways you can give here at Grace. Uh, you can use the baskets uh, that are by the doors as you leave to drop something in there, or you can um, send something to the church through mail, or even use our online methods, our website or our church app. Uh, all those are good ways, or even contact our church office for uh, setting up automated giving as well. And if you're visiting with us, we really uh, hope that you don't feel pressured to give in any way. This is meant for our uh, regular attenders and our members to be uh, to be thinking about. So uh, please just be visiting with us today and, and don't feel like you uh, need to give anything for today. And uh, let me pray for our offering. Lord, we're thankful that we can uh, worship here this morning, and we're thankful that you have supplied everything we need in our lives. And we acknowledge that everything we have is because uh, you've given it to us. And we pray that you would give us just really uh, thankful hearts for the things that you've allowed us to have in our lives. And we pray that we would cheerfully give back to you uh, for everything you've given to us, just out of true appreciation for, for the grace and the love that you offer us. So it's with that spirit that we give to you. And we pray that for the uh, gifts that are collected, Lord, that we would be wise in the ways that we use them. We pray that you would give us real vision and wisdom uh, in, in the ways that we are using the funds that are collected this morning, Lord. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, just a, a brief uh, announcement about what is coming up later today. Uh, after the second service, if you haven't heard, we're going to have a lunch uh, together as a church uh, in the building here. We're going to have pizza and salad together, and wait for it, it is Jets pizza. Okay, I know that, every, I know that was the thing that was on everybody's mind, but we're going to have some Jets uh, downstairs. Then what we're going to do is we're going to invite everyone to come back uh, into this uh, space here. Uh, we will have child care for, for children up until uh, fifth grade. And uh, at that time, what we're going to do is we're going to share with you a little bit more about the concept for the Community Life Center. We'll have some uh, blueprints that you can look at. We'll share a little bit more about the cost. And then we're going to um, have a time just for people to share feedback, ask questions, give us you know, positive things, concerns, anything like that as we move towards a process where eventually we're planning to, to survey uh, the congregation together. And, and what the elders are really trying to do is we're trying to answer when it comes to this project two questions. First of all, should we do something like this? Okay, is this the right idea? Is, is this something that you could envision being helpful to our church family? Or maybe not. Is there a different idea that we need to come up with? So when you hear the idea, wow, you know, we, we could have events there. Are there events that come to mind for you? You know, do you think, oh, I could do this, or we could reach out in this way or that way? Because what we don't want to do is we don't want to build something and have it just sit there all week, okay? We want to use it. And the only way to know whether or not we're going to use it is to ask everyone to get their feedback. So the question is, should we do this, first of all? Uh, the second question that we have to ask is, could we do this? Okay, because there's a, a cost that's associated to the project, which we're going to talk about a little bit after lunch. There is a, a, a very large expense. So we have to ask the question, can we raise the amount of money that would be needed to develop this place and, and, and continue to pay for its expenses? Or is that going to put us in a, in a financial situation that we don't want to be into? We, we want to be wise about this on both ends. So should we do this? Could we do this? The, the elders, again, as I've said, the only way to know the answer to those two questions, we can talk about it all that we want, right? But eventually, we have to come here because that, this is the way that those questions get answered. So again, just want to invite you to be a part of, of that process if you're able to. If you can't stay for lunch and um, our, our town hall today, which is going to last for about an hour, then um, feel free to come and talk with us. Give us your feedback. Again, we'll have other more formal opportunities for you to do that. But we really um, covet your prayer and participation during this time. All right? 
wow, I actually finished at 1030. I, I'm really happy ab about this. Uh, why don't we stand and we'll close. It's the little things that make me happy. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take Jets Pizza and finishing at 1030. Father, as we go from this place today, we pray that you would help us, not, not just in this moment, to be honest Christians and faithful Christians and repentant Christians and serious Christians. We want to be that way all week. We know that what your son has done changes everything for our lives and for this world. And so we pray that you would strengthen our hearts so that we can walk with you, enjoy relationship with you, and enjoy extending that relationship with others. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in grace.